Good afternoon. Uh, it's time to start our public forum. My name is Susanna von Kemmerer and I'm the Deputy Director of the Centre of Excellence for Translational Photosynthesis. And I'm delighted to welcome you here for our first public forum. Um, the title of our, the topic of our discussion today is Innovation that may solve food shortages, the potential of photosynthesis research in increasing agricultural production. But before I start, I want to first uh, acknowledge and celebrate the first Australians on whose traditional lands we meet and pay our respect to the elders of the Ngunnawal people past and present. Today's public forum introduces the aims and the research of the centre that has now been opened, and it's an opportunity for you to ask us questions on the research into improving photosynthesis and how it is a key to solving some of our biggest challenges in uh, avoiding food shortages. The forum's format will commence with 10 minute speeches. We're hoping to have four speeches and um, then will be followed by questions and answers where you can ask the chief investigators of the center questions uh, about the research that we're about to do. Um, I would like to introduce the four speakers for today. Our first speaker is Professor Aidan Burns, CEO of the Australian Research Council. Hopefully our second speaker will be Professor Ian Chubb, the chief um, scientist, but uh, we're not sure yet whether he'll be able to come in time. <laughs> our third speaker will be Professor Murray Badger, the director of the center, and our fourth speaker will be Professor John Evans, also chief investigator of the center. So now we'll start with our first speaker, Professor Ian Byrne. He's the CEO of the Australian Research Council, and he's well known to ANU. He was a uh, Dean of the Faculty of Science, and then he was Director of uh, the College of Physical and Mathematical Science. Please welcome Professor Ayn Byrne. Uh, thanks very much, Suzanne. Can people hear me here without me going in and out through the microphone? Yep. Um, I've got 10 minutes, and if Ian doesn't come, I can talk for the whole time. <laughs> I, I do want to call it. Um, Big, big shoes to fill the um, I, I do want to apologise because I do have to run away to another meeting towards the end of the session, um, but I'll try and stay as long as I can. Uh, what I wanted to do a little bit is not talk too specifically into the topic of your meeting, but try and to give an overview of the research landscape uh, in Australia because it's a very interesting time. Uh, you know, it's the old adage, we live in very interesting times. And it is interesting to reflect on um, some of the interconnectedness, and I talked a few moments ago about the importance of our sense of excellence uh, for combining different disciplines together, and I want to show you some uh, very nice pictures which were prepared by Alex Watt, who's just sitting right there, uh, done a lot of work with Alex, um, and I think they tell some interesting stories. Uh, very, uh, Professor Chubb's here, so I've got to go very quickly now. <laughs> uh, this... <laughs> I was going to use all your time here, but now you're here, I'm going to hand it over to you. <laughs> so this is an interesting graph um, that is worth reflecting on, which is the federal budget. Uh, it's an interesting graph that I stole the idea from a, a similar one that I saw from the UK, and in some ways it's my where's Wally speech, um, because the question I asked was, where's the ARC on this? Uh, and people in the front might be able to find it, uh, people in the back have got no chance. It's one of the little specks on the diagram here. Uh, now, of course, the ARC is the Department of Education, so that's us here. That's the spending of the federal government for the ARC. NHMRC is associated with health, so that's the NHMRC here. Uh, CSIRO's up here. And if you look down here, these little specks here, uh, the Research and Development Corporation entities, these are the entities uh, contributing to research. Now, it is interesting to reflect that you know, those bodies perhaps collectively with a few others have actually the potential to change the nation. Uh, and we do have to think about what the government does spend and how important a contribution that universities can make through research, uh, but also other organisations, and how little actually gets spent in some of the sciences and some of the areas. And Ian, I'm sure, will talk a bit about priorities and posts. Can I that yeah, yeah. Yeah, thanks. Um, this is the other graph that you may be concerned with is the federal government spend across those different areas. So it's looking at it differently, collecting up the little dots, <coughs> if you like, 
becomes more impressive when it's one big pie, and it's not an unimpressive pie. You know, it's sort of eight, nine uh, billion dollars that the government spends on research and research and development. Um, the ARC and NH and NRC are up here. Uh, we have about 10% of the pie each, and we've just crossed over, actually. So the NHMRC now is administering more money than the ARC. Uh, and we have our medical future fund coming on board, uh, which will increase that speed even further. Uh, universities, of course, also have access to block grant money. That's this part of the pie. Uh, we have CSIRO, DSDO, and other agencies. Mm -hmm. uh, rural uh, research is actually quite a small component. CRC is quite a small component. Again, you know, the opportunities to make meaningful transformation of the country um, are challenges for us. Uh, this is another perspective of how we spend our money. So this is ARC spending into the research sector of universities in the country. And the ARC is a university fund. We fund primarily university research, and that's how it's distributed. Highly concentrated into a relatively small set of universities. But that's not an uncommon pattern. If you look at the same pattern across the UK and other countries, it's, it's almost the same shape curve. And actually, it's remarkably stable. Uh, I have a graph that I'm not showing here, um, which shows the situation 40 years ago. And although the players have changed names, uh, different institutions leave, uh, the shape is exactly the same. And I would actually anticipate in the new world, the government's deregulation agenda, if anything, a slight concentration, not a deconcentration of that resource spend. Um, these are our competitive grants programs that most of you know very well. I, I do. Um, it's a tragic joke, but I do joke with the agency of disappointment. Uh, we disappoint more people than we please. It is a very competitive process that has an advantage because it does keep quality high, so there's an important component to that. Uh, and we're also diverse in terms of our schemes. I mentioned this morning the importance to us of the centres of excellence. I think they're vitally important to the health of the system. Uh, another one that the government's committed to, albeit coupled with the higher education programs, is the future fellowship schemes. And I was very pleased uh, this year in the budget, uh, the announcement of an ongoing future fellowship scheme. And it's really very, very important uh, that ongoing statement at the end of the funding scheme is critically important. And this government, too, I think, is uh, fairly strong committed to looking at solutions for an ongoing infrastructure solution as well. Um, I don't think I want to dwell on that. Um, I've got this one in here because we are talking about centres of excellence and it is interesting to reflect um, which ones were more successful. Um, sort of every year <coughs> around, there's been one sort of discipline group that's been slightly more successful than others. Um, that's completely random. Uh, this last cycle, it was the biotech areas, and that's perhaps an emergence of the bio in the broad uh, areas that were quite successful. And I guess from this community's point of view, you want that to be the same next time, and there's nothing in the system that will prevent that. It's the quality of the research that we're um, I want to talk a little bit about linkage projects, because again, uh, this last week, uh, the government announced its uh, industry innovation and competitiveness agenda and there's a lot of conversations about how researchers in universities sh should be connected to industry and, and, and indeed vice versa. Um, it's my view that uh, our system needs some corrections to it uh, but the fault doesn't just lie with universities, doesn't just lie with industry and we both the to achieve those outcomes. Uh, this is an interesting graph that um, Alex has done for the ANU and this is plotting the partner organisations in linkage, so linkage projects, uh, with the Australian National University. And I apologise to uh, other universities that are not here. Yesterday I was in Sydney and showed the Sydney one, uh, and I've also shown the Sydney sometimes. Um, so, what's the story here? The interesting story is, is the colour code here, in a sense. Um, the linkage programme, if you look about it, you look at it as a vehicle for connecting with industry, it is an abject failure, and no, that's, that's not true, and I didn't say that, don't quote me on that with the camera at the back. Um, that's not true. Uh, when I go through the linkage grants that are successful, the connections um, and the outcomes, you know, if 20% come off, uh, they really will change the nation. I mean, when you read en masse all of the outcomes, it is really quite uplifting and quite supporting, I think, uh, to the notion that universities are connecting effectively outside. But they are not, the system for linkage projects is not just connecting to industry. 
effect of the connection to industry. If it was only connected to industry, this picture would be a mass of, of red. But only 28% of the linkage projects are connected to industry business. Now, of course, that doesn't mean that there aren't unimportant other ones, so government agencies, hospitals, uh, state governments, federal government departments, all of those other things that are important for the running of the nation are in there as well, but it's not just industry. Uh, and again, there's a, a smattering of not for profits uh, We can turn this picture around the other way. That was a, a focus on a university. Uh, you could do a focus picture, a focus picture on a company like Cochlear and look which institutions are contributing to that research enterprise. And again, you know, if we really are to address the problem of how to connect universities with industry, uh, we do have to think about complacent. Um, this is a landscape of our linkage ones, uh, but across all the universities. Uh, this one here is the ANU, but there are others up here. This one here, I think, is Sydney. Uh, one of these is Melbourne. Uh, one of those is Monash. And it's an interesting map now to see uh, which of these institutions are connected to, to what centres. You can zoom in and focus on that. Uh, the scheme that we did introduce, and I, I, I am talking quite a lot here about the connections of the academic research enterprise to industry. Um, you know, an important thing that the ARC does do is to support basic research and, and I hope we can always do that. Um, but it is also important that researchers articulate why they're doing research, even though it might be very, very basic. And I also think it's very important that researchers think of opportunities, as the centre does, uh, to translate the work that they're doing out into the world. So the ITRP is a, a scheme that we've really just introduced over the last year or so, and it's just getting some traction. And uh, I would encourage people to think about that as well, because one of the priority areas in that, uh, the priority areas that we heard about this morning from the Senator, is in the agribusiness space. And again, the Centre is not a million miles away from that. And connection to industry solving industry problems, I think, is going to be as one of the, the parts that the Centre will be raised with. Uh, this is the same map we have from our ITRP schemes, research uh, hubs and training centres. And again, the dominant colour is here, blue, is the um, industry, commercial sectors, and it is deliberately targeted that way, and I'm very optimistic uh, about this project. Uh, so this is another bit of eye candy, but again, very, very interesting, and this is a network map of our grants. So one of the things centres do, I think, very valuably, as I said earlier this morning, is to stimulate multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary, connected research in a way that an individual research group can't do. And this is showing a very interesting map, I think, of, um, this is on this side, the STEM subjects, and they're categorised by the colour here, which is the field of research code at a two-digit level, as you probably the four-digit codes up here. And you do see how interconnected all of that is. Um, the colour just to focus on for a moment is the medical science, which does run through here. Uh, at the moment in this country, we spend as much money on medical research as we do on all other research in the world. Um, now, that's interesting for the sector. I mean, the research that you do is not particularly medical research. Um, and we do, in my view, have to reflect whether that's a right balance. Now, that's certainly true that we've got excellent medical research in this country. Uh, but if you think that we spend as much on medical research as everything else in we would want to. And uh, Ian may talk a bit, a bit more about priorities and so on and focus. Uh, it is something that we do need to think about as a nation, and I think we've uh, got that well in hand. Uh, looking at this picture a different way around, um, I'm plotting in colour now that the humanities disciplines, the HAS, the humanities, arts, and social sciences mm -hmm. ones, and again, they are equally connected and there is an interconnectedness of the medical research going all through that scheme. And there are indeed some connections you know, from these ones up into the, the science, but they're not disconnected entities. So if you're looking at problems uh, that are of real significance to our community, uh, you need both a STEM perspective on things that I think you need know, to so. And um, this is just one focusing in for this audience, just the biology fields of research goes to see how we think they're interconnected. Now this of course is dependent on the application that you give to us and the codes that you write down on your application, but um, there are, I'm sure, stories there. And I think I've got a model up there because I've got a good year. Thank you. Thank you very much.
I'm now delighted to introduce Professor Chubb as our second speaker. Um, Professor Chubb has been Chief Scientist, Australian Chief Scientist since 2011. And of course, he's also well known to the ANU, where he's been Vice Chancellor for 10 years. Professor Chubb, thank you. Uh, thanks, Susan. Colleagues, former colleagues, Fred. Yes, there is one. <laughs> the, um, it's good to be back and to uh, talk about this important issue. Um, I want to take off, off uh, um, from some of uh, Aidan's talk. And um, one of the things that I think uh, we need collectively to focus on is if you remember his pie chart there and uh, the distribution that he had. Uh, that's the distribution this year of $9.2 billion of uh, Commonwealth money. It sits alongside around about $18 billion of commercial stroke industry R&D, so we're at about 2.1% of GDP. But what the pie chart hides is the fact that uh, within it there are approximately 170 different programs supporting in this country across a wide range, spread across maybe it's a bit 14 portfolios uh, in the federal government, and no linkages, nothing like the community. Virtually none. Not none, but virtually. And I think it's important that we recognise that when we talk about how we support R&D in this country, it depends on the audience and it depends on the topic and it depends on the origin, as it were, because each part of that uh, complex matrix will have a view, and arguably, oftentimes, a different view. Um, when you get it down to bigger entities, then you could say that, uh, to be generous, we've got around about seven sizable programs hiding behind that pie chart. And it's uh, something that we're going to discuss with the government when the Science Council uh, first meets in uh, the not too distant future. And uh, because sooner or later we're going to have to grapple with our reality. Our funding is rationed. It's been rationed for as long as I can remember. I can remember as a young researcher, uh, or at least, well, still a young researcher, but as a member of the main interviewing committees of the NH and MRC when we would go and interview, say in Perth, 80 applicants, and you knew 20 of them would get a grant, 25 of them would get a grant. And it's not to say that you couldn't have funded 35 or 40, it's to say that there was only enough money to fund 20 or 25. So it's always been rationed. The consequence of which is that within the research area, as well as within the university area, uh, vice chancellors, for as long as I can remember, have argued for more money. And they've said we need more money. And when they ask what for, they say, because we haven't got it. And when they get asked, what would you do with it? They say, spend it. <laughs> and when they say, what would you spend it on? Or why would you spend it? They say, well, because we haven't got enough. <laughs> so what do you want? Well, we want more money. <laughs> why? Well, we haven't got enough. <laughs> and the consequence of that is almost zero in 35 years with little trickles and adjustments here and there, and a couple of noted bald spikes. There were two spikes under John Howard's Prime Ministership, but there's been one um, with Rudd. Uh, noticeable, that is to say, not incremental adjustments, or whatever, but some sizable uh, injections. Uh, but generally, um, that was not as a consequence of making a good case for why we needed more, and why we needed to do and think about things differently. So one of the issues that's before us as a scientific community is um, how we cope with that spread, that diversity. Now, I'm not arguing for a single central point at all, whatever you might think I'm leading to. I'm not arguing, but I am arguing for some coherence in the suite of programs so we can actually understand fully what we're doing at some depth and understand what all of this actually means for Australia's capacity build the capability that we need to do the things that we want to do and alongside that the things that we've got to do. One of the things that wasn't on Aiden's chart uh, quite properly 
is the amount of money that comes into the university sector through the grant of the students. Now, the uh, definition of a university in this country today is that they have to do research to be called a university. To be called a university at the moment, you have to do research in at least three of the areas in which you teach, but no more, but at least three, and then ultimately start growing to the point where you do research in all the areas that you teach. There are two ways you can do that. Only teach three areas or grow your research capability, but we don't have the resources to support it on the scale that that would actually uh, engineer. So what are we going to do about that? Are we just going to assume that we can go along and say, we want more money because we haven't got enough, and if you go to the tools, we can spend it because we haven't got enough, so we want more money? When we actually want to think about what it means to be able to deliver the things that we need to be able to deliver. So let me uh, just say that when the Department of whatever it was at the time, the one with the name that was this long, that is now this long, um, was, uh, it's now called industry, it was called a lot of other things. <laughs> ones you can talk about and ones that you can only talk about behind your hand. Um, but, uh, but when it was that, and I did a survey of uh, staff to find out how much time they spent on research across Australia, the portion of time spent was 40%. Okay, now, I don't know that it's ever been published, but it was 40% across the board. You might think that that's true. You might think that it seems a little high, given the spread of research capability and capacity across the sector. That's what it was. So 40% of the 10 odd billion that goes into the university sector adds a lot to that chart. So it makes the university central to Australia's research capacity and essential to the development of Australia's research capability. And uh, we've, we've got to work out better uh, how to organise that and how to get the resources that we need to make sure that we've got at least some of them in the right place uh, and at the right time. <coughs> um, so I think that there are some serious challenges uh, ahead of us. I think um, the Prime Minister, I think it was the Prime Minister announced a couple of weeks ago that the new Commonwealth Science Council will be meeting soon. He hasn't given a date. It's still his priority to announce the date, so that will be announced soon. Um, but uh, one of the issues on there is going to be whether or not we should begin to do what many other countries do. Many other countries, including ones that we would be happy to compare and contrast ourselves with. So you can think of the UK, you can think of the EU as a federation, you can think of the US, you can think of Canada. In different ways, they focus on particular areas, not to the exclusion of all others, by no means to the exclusion of all others, but indeed in the way to encourage activity in areas where they believe they have capacity, capability, real need, or where they can make a difference through their contributions. And I think it's not a question that we've asked ourselves in any serious way in this country. We've assumed that we should do what we want to do and that somebody somewhere will pick up the tab if we say for long enough, frequently enough, loudly enough, that we need more money because we can spend more money, not because we need more money to achieve particular outcomes. It's never been a good tactic and I think presently it will be even less successful than it's been in the past. So we have to hold up approaches, we have to hold up ways, we have to be willing to argue particular things that might be quite novel for us. And then we have to use some models to show them. So the centre that's being launched today is a good example of one of the things that you can hold up and say, this is how we can do things in Australia when we have the will and the willing uh, to get together, to work together across disciplines on topics that are critically important. Now, agriculture has been a little hobby horse of mine um, over the last uh, couple of years because uh, I was quite startled to find how rapidly the decline had been in the number of um, students studying agricultural science in Australia. Uh, you know and I know that agricultural science is not the only pathway into research in agriculture. But nevertheless, it's indicative, I think, of 
any number of things. I mean, it's usually complex, and we could go through each of them. And I'll take even longer than Nathan just did. But the, um, the, uh, uh, well, it could be as brief as that thing. Um, but, um, but, but, it, but it is indicative that we've got issues here that we just can't be drift. We can't just say, it'll be okay. So we've got a trade minister in neighbouring countries signing off trade agreements, which are going to require a very significant increase in the agricultural output. And when they were first announced, we're going to increase our agricultural uh, exports to, say, South Korea by 70%. You could say, oh, yeah, well, that's good. That just means a redistribution. Then it goes on to talk about new jobs created in Australia. So it's not actually a redistribution, it's actually increased production. So how are we going to increase production when we're not the research base, or have we got the research base to support increased production? It's <coughs> the question that I ask them all the time. How do we know? Have we got the pipeline coming through? Have we got undergraduate students working in agricultural science directly as agricultural science students, or in less directly as students studying genetics or whatever it might be? In a, in a BSc, but have we got them coming through in the numbers we want? Do we have the students transferring into, translating into PhD programs in the numbers we want? Are we bringing the dis different disciplines that we need together to do the sort of research that we need to do to get what is presently a government position that we will increase agricultural exports to countries in our region? So if we sign one with Korea, we sign one with Japan, we're going to sign one with China probably, they take the tariffs off coal, um, but, uh, but we will we'll sign this, and all of them will require increased agricultural production. Now, we've lived in a fantasy land. We've lived in a land where politicians have gone around the country for a few years talking about Australia being the food bowl. It started off being the food bowl of Asia. More recently, it's been the food bowl of the world. Until the Minister for Agriculture a couple of weeks ago, made it perfectly clear that he does not believe that it could be the food bowl of anything, but that we could contribute significantly to the nutrition and diets of many more people around the planet than we presently do. And I think that's a legitimate aspiration to be able to do that. And we will do that through increased agricultural production. So, what are we going to do? Are we going to say, well, let's just sit around and wait and see what happens? Are we going to say that students who are starting school next year who won't actually enter the workforce till about 2030, we will exert no influence over their choices, their teaching, their instruction, the enthusiasm with which they're taught, the inspiration with which they're taught. We won't have anything to do that because it'll all be right by 2030. <laughs> anyway, I bet you that there would be only one politician presently in the parliament who would still be in the parliament in 30 years to in, in 16, 17 years time. Uh, it would be more than that. It would probably be 80% of them. But um, <laughs> there would be, be a few. Uh, but they, they, uh, the, the thing is that we're planning for a different world. We're not planning for what it is to be. We're planning for something different. We're seeing our climate change. I saw a magnificent model we like to use the term model in universities. We saw them at the moment, put out by NOAA about winter rainfall in Australia. If you haven't seen it, go have a look. What it's telling you is that over the next little while there'll be a very significant drop in rainfall in the southeast of Australia and the southwest of Australia. What do we do in the southeast and southwest? We grow stuff. What do we do with that? We eat some and we sell some. We export some. And winter rainfall, the planting season, is going to drop. What sort of plants will we be growing? As I did say facetiously in one speech, that given that it's all moving to the north, that uh, the average over Australia might be the same. But the point is, there is surely a limit to the number of macadamia nuts we could flood off to the South Koreans <laughs> <laughs> and all mangoes. Maybe the way I would actually genetic the modified mango that looks like a looks like a uh, macadamia nut. <laughs> or oh, it's got a macadamia nut in the middle, you can eat that too. <laughs> But anyway, colleagues, I think that we've got a lot of questions to ask ourselves. We should ask them seriously, we should look for serious answers, we should act on them. But at the end of the day, I would be remarkably surprised if we don't follow the path of many other countries 
and for a proportion of our total nine plus billion dollar research pen, they were not saying that there are some, some areas that just at this moment are more important than others and that will change over time and that we're not trying to exclude people and get them out of this or get them out of that. We're simply saying that with a rational resource, you have to carefully deploy it to get the outcomes that you need to be prosperous. Thank you. I'd now like to introduce our third speaker, Professor Murray Badger. Professor Murray Badger is the director of this new Center of Translational Photosynthesis. He is listed as one of the most highly cited plant animal scientists in Australia, and he was elected to the Australian Academy of Science in 2008. Murray will outline some of the center research aims and how we could solve some of the food shortages. Thank you, Murray. Thanks, Susanna. So John Evans and I are going to try and give you a flavour of what the Centre of Excellence is all about in terms of purpose and its research. And uh, can I go back to the first slide? Please. And one of the first things I'd like to do is I'm often asked, if I, if my grandmother asked me, you know, what, what's translational photosynthesis? I've got to give her an explanation, and I must say that I actually stole the term translational photosynthesis from translational medicine. So translational medicine is one where you take basic medicine, medical research and apply it to, to produce real-world cures for human disease. Well, translational photosynthesis, by analogy, is one where we take basic photosynthesis research and apply it to uh, produce uh, improvements in the photosynthetic process that can support increased yield. So the, 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 tra the centre itself is funded by the ARC to about 222 million, plus there's about $9 million contribution from uh, collaborating institutions. And we're composed of the uh, Australian National University, University of Queensland, University of Sydney, University of Western Sydney, CSIRO flagship and the uh, Agriculture flagship and the International Life Forest Research Institute. I feel quite excited about having a centre on photosynthesis because I spent most of my life researching what I think is probably the most important, well it is the most important biological process on earth. It's actually been responsible for a lot of things that you, you may or may not realise. One is it, it obviously produced all the oxygen in the atmosphere, it's produced the ozone layer that produce, protects the earth from damaging radiation, it's produced all the fossil fuels that we depend on, it's actually even to produced the iron ore deposits through the iron oxides that are produced in the Hammersley Range and so Australia has been prospered as a result of it. It's responsible for CO2 regulation in the atmosphere to a significant extent. It has a huge effect on the aesthetic uh, influence of the environment. So our, our green world would not be a green world without photosynthesis. And finally, it's responsible for all the food production that supports civilization. So it is an important process and it's uh, exciting to be associated with research that, that looks about how we can improve it. So what is photosynthesis for all of you, you and the audience that, that is not totally aware of the process? And I'll try and give you a snapshot of it. It's actually composed of two separate phases. One is there's a light phase which captures the, the light that's coming in. It's a bit like a photovoltaic cell. It, con it converts light energy into to chemical energy and it re releases oxygen in the process. And there's a second type part of the reaction which uses that energy to fix carbon dioxide into sugars and useful biomass that is the basis of food production. And the enzyme that I'll so, so highlight here is one that will, will be mentioned a number of times. We endearingly call it Rubisco is responsible for that. CO2 fixation. And when you do this process in a leaf as opposed to an alga or, or a cyanobacteria, you actually undergo a process of exchange of gases. CO2 goes into the leaf, the water vapor comes out. So there's an intricate coupling between those processes within the leaf situation. So what do we do mean by transforming photosynthesis? Well, one way to look at it is, is this, is that in a, it's actually quite an inefficient process. So of 100% of the light energy falling on the leaf, only about 4 to 6 percent of that finally ends up as dry weight and, and usable plant material at the end of the day because of various inefficiencies. One of those inefficiencies is that light is only absorbed by a certain spectral bandwidth of the chlorophyll molecules, and so that's about 50 percent. Then there's chemical inefficiencies in converting that light energy through to chemical energy and then using it to fix carbon dioxide. So what, what, what John will talk about is research that we have planned that will open the window for light absorption here improve the efficiency with that, which that light is converted to CO2 and enlarge the capacity of photosynthesis within leaves. So we hope at the end of the day to, to produce something like an increase from 4 to 6%, 6 to 
conversion, which is a significant increase in the chemical efficiency of the process. So why do we need a, yield, a, a photosynthesis? Well, we need it to basically start a new yield revolution, the way we put it. So this is the graph of the population increase in the world, and it will be about 9 million people by the year 2050. Uh, and up to about 2000, year 2000, the increase in yields was keeping pace with, with uh, population increase. But there's been a slowing of yield increases, so that we're out of track in terms of the yield increases proposed, the possible yield increases supporting the world's increasing population. So it's been apparent to a number of people that we, we need to improve, improve the yield by having another yield revolution. And I've uh, controversially said that this can be achieved through improved photosynthesis and biomass production, and I've termed it as the second golden revolution because this first part here was supported by what was termed the green revolution. And now is the time for us to undertake translational photosynthesis. One, one of the reasons to do that is in the context of what Ian Chubb said is that it's good to get scientists and the industry together to invest in industries that, that are going to make a difference. But photosynthesis is a fundamental and untapped op opportunity. So there's a real opportunity for raising yield by improving photosynthesis. Well, our world, we are in Australia world leaders in that process and we've produced fundamental knowledge over the last 30 years which actually acts as the basis for, for the applied research going forward. We've actually got new tools that are able to link our studies in the laboratory in the field and produce the results that we, we're looking for. And uh, there's unparalleled opportunities with regard to funding and, and uh, crop opportunities to translate these discoveries into the, to the field and improve yields. And there's a real opportunity for Australia to be a world leader in what we've termed this new field of translational photosynthesis. So I think the time is right. We're well connected in terms of, of our distribution of, of effort so that the centre itself is, is centred on the east coast of Australia here with links into Erie and the Philippines. <coughs> We've got links to other crop, international crop improvement centres in Hikusat and Simic, uh, and uh, we've got academic links into Europe, China and the USA. So we're, we're well networked in terms of the world uh, photosynthesis and crop yield community uh, and, and are well placed to take advantage of any of the breakthroughs that we're, we're going to make. International networks and funding has gone into a little bit more detail here. We, we already have connections with, um, with uh, three projects funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, uh, which <coughs> we are incorporating as part of the centre. And they cover crops of rice and sorghum and wheat. Um, CIMIT uh, is, is part of it, Ikrisat, a number of universities in the, in the US and China and, uh, and Europe, and a number of uh, commercial companies. Uh, uh, and we have projects or interest from them in terms of, of funding. Where will the centre be in seven years? Well, facetiously I've said, and, and I said this at the interview of our ARC uh, centre, that what we'd like to do is start at what I term the golden revolution based on photosynthetic improvement. And this was the basis of leading to increased world food, food security. It's a big ask, but that's, that's the vision. In practical terms, we, we'll have delivered pre-breeding strategies to increase the yield potential of crops, and it will establish linkages with public good and private industries to translate those pre-breeding solutions into improved varieties. And if we've done all that, we'll certainly become an international leader in the field of the newly uh, denoted field that I call translational photosynthesis. And we'll have trained a new generation of researchers in photosynthesis and its translation, which is quite important for the future of, of this field in agriculture in the world and, uh, and Australia. So I'll hand over to John now to talk about the actual research that we're going on in the So I've got a race through the scientific program that we're proposing in, in this centre. I thought I'd start um, with Norman Borlaug. So this is the 100th year since he was born. He's the founder of the Green Revolution. And what he did was take a conventional plant breeding approach of crossing two different parents together with different characters and then through a recurrent selection of each gener subsequent generation, um, keep selecting for the recombination of, of valuable traits form a better progeny. Uh, now the trouble is uh, basically the end of the road has been achieved with that conventional approach and it's well recognised um, that further step change to increase productivity will re actually require an increase in total biomass which is driven by photosynthesis. So Murray already gave you a brief introduction to the process of photosynthesis. It's a complex process but it's well understood. 
And the idea of the, the center is basically what we need to do is improve the efficiency of the resources available. So photosynthesis basically exchanges carbon dioxide from the atmosphere with water, and we want to improve um, that conversion efficiency, and we want to convert more of the sunlight that's intercepted into biomass and yield. Now the research carried out by the centre is divided into four research programs. So we have the traditional break, breakdown of, of photosynthesis into the dark reactions, CO2 fixation, and the light reactions of photosynthesis. And then the third program is going to be looking at utilising natural variation which is, is existing already out in the environment. And finally we want to pull it all together and use computer models to actually simulate uh, improved performance and what the impact of the various changes that we'll target. But before I go into that detail, I need to introduce some of the background biochemistry. Now Murray already introduced the Visco. This enzyme is associated with fixing almost all of the carbon that's present in the biosphere. Uh, it, it's an enzyme that catalyzes two different reactions. The first one is to react with carbon dioxide and in the process forms sugar and produces biomass. So that's, that's basically the goal. It also reacts with oxygen. And unfortunately, when that reaction happens, it produces a wasteful uh, product and a considerable amount of energy is then expended actually recovering back to the starting point. Now, photosynthesis has been so successful in transforming the atmosphere of the Earth that in fact it's made um, the job of this enzyme progressively more difficult because oxygen has increased and carbon dioxide has gone down. Now while there's genetic diversity in the enzyme of Rubisco, it's, it's apparent that actually evolution hasn't been able to counter this increasing oxygen um, poisoning of the enzyme and instead has opted multiple times to invent CO2 concentrating mechanisms to circumvent the problem of the oxygen uh, reaction. So this has arisen many times and it's found in algal cells and also a, a, a different type of photosynthetic pathway called C4 photosynthesis, which is typified by maize, sorghum and sugarcane, which are important crops. So what's the evidence that if we improve photosynthesis, we'd actually trans be able to translate that into an increase in yield? Well, there are two examples of you. The first one is illustrated here. So C4 maize, which is a, a, a plant which has a CO2 concentrating mechanism, was grown alongside, so it's at the top of the picture here, was grown alongside rice, which is a C3 cereal crop. So this experiment was conducted in the Philippines at the International Rice Research Institute. And these two crops were planted and grown for the same length of time, and after 42 days, the C4 maize crop, which has the CO2 concentrating mechanism, yielded more than 50% more, in, an increase of 50% over what was apparent from the C3 rice. The second example uh, is uh, shown for C3 rice crop, and that's the fact that the CO2 fixation rate increases as the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere increases. So along the x-axis is the CO2 concentration available to the plant during growth at 400 parts per million. This is where the current atmosphere is. And you can see that if we increase CO2 even further, the photosynthetic rate is stimulated and that is apparent in an increased growth of the crop. So both of these are examples where you can demonstrate that if we improve photosynthesis, we will be able to increase the biomass production. Okay, now turning to the four research programs. I'll start with program one, which its objective is to improve CO2 fixation. Now, uh, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation has already funded a, a, an a impressive project to try and introduce the C4 uh, photosynthetic pathway into rice, and that is being hosted by the International Rice Research Institute, and we, we have uh, some involvement with that. So rather than duplicate that effort, we're approaching it from an, a, a parallel track, which is to introduce CO2 pumps from uh, algal cells into chloroplasts, which are uh, alike in the very distant uh, or early stages of um, life on the planet. So we take a, a CO2 transporter from the algae and insert it into the envelope of the chloroplast. And this has been already achieved. And what we are now working on is actually refining the control and regulation of that CO2 transporter. 
We can make that whole system even more efficient by packaging up Rubisco and then closing it into a special body inside the chloroplast. And we also are trying to manipulate the permeability of CO2 around the envelope of the chloroplast. The other major part of this program is to actually target Rubisco and, and improve it. Now we know um, that, that there's a, a diverse forms of Rubisco out there amongst um, different organisms. And unfortunately, not many of them have been uh, sampled and, and um, their properties have yet to be determined. So we're uh, uh, undertaking a, a comprehensive analysis of, of scoping out what the diversity uh, available to us will be. And then Spencer Whitney has developed um, pioneers in technology which will allow us to introduce very precisely changes to the amino acid sequence of the enzyme and thereby able to improve the performance of the Rubisco enzyme. The second program is basically trying to improve the conversion of sunlight into biomass. Now Murray introduced the concept of opening the solar window. So chlorophyll is the pigment in plants which gives the green colour to leaves. And higher plants basically utilise two forms of chlorophyll called chlorophyll A and B. And they absorb in the visible part of the solar spectrum, which, are, which accounts for about half of the energy in sunlight. Recently, two other forms of chlorophyll have been discovered, chlorophyll D and F, uh, in rare aquatic organisms. And they extend the window of the solar spectrum and uh, in the near infrared, and an additional 20% of sunlight's energy could perhaps be harnessed into the process of photosynthesis if we can build them into um, a higher plant photosynthetic system. The second aim in this program is to raise the ceiling. So the photosynthetic, um, the light reactions involve a, a large number of complex protein complexes and the plant adjusts the relative abundance of these complexes depending in response to the environment. Uh, in previous work we've shown that two of these complexes are really important in defining um, the maximum rate at which the light reactions can occur. So our objective is to increase the level of expression of these complexes, thereby raising the ceiling and lifting uh, the limitations currently placed on the maximum photosynthetic rate under high light. Now the third program is, is hoping to utilise uh, existing natu natural variation which has already evolved. There are huge collections of, of seeds available for various important crop plants like wheat, rice and sorghum that we have available. And the challenge is to actually identify characters in those seed collections which are useful and pertinent to photosynthesis. And it's a numbers game. We basically have to find really rare events. And to make it possible, we have to develop high-throughput optical screens that allow us to find that very rare event, capture it, discover the genetic basis, and then be able to translate that and transfer that into breeding programs. So if you like, we're trying to invent a Google that can search the germplasms that already have evolved and take photosynthetic properties and incorporate them into breeding programs. Finally, we want to be able to demonstrate that what we're, we're seeking to do is actually going to achieve uh, an increase in plant growth and yield. Now you might think the best way to do that is to actually take plants and compare them in yield trials. Unfortunately to do these really precise comparisons takes years to generate the seeds that are, enable a field trial to occur. Instead we're going to adopt the idea of a computer simulation model. So we're going to take an established um, model of photosynthesis that's based on biochemistry of the process and insert that into an agricultural production simulating um, model that uh, Graham Hammer up at the University of Queensland is, is intimately involved with. Now the beauty of this approach is that you can go back and look at historical weather records for the last century at different locations and with the push of a button you can now simulate the performance of your new plant under a huge range of conditions and many seasons, which is something that, that would take forever to do if you're actually doing a specific field trial. So in this way, we can basically identify what is the expected return for each change that we, we, we contemplate, and you can prioritize which ones are the, are the changes that are likely to have the most benefit. So finally, 
what's all this going to do? We have four overlapping programs that are all focused and harnessed towards increasing yield by targeting specific properties of the photosynthetic system, where we have identified there's potential to increase the conversion efficiency of scarce resources. Thank you. concludes our session of, uh, of speakers and we now move to the question and answering session and I'd like to call on Bob Furbank to come and um, chair this session. Bob is one of our partner investigators of the Centre of Excellence. He's a chief research scientist at CSRO and he's the scientific director of the High Resolution Plant Genomics Centre. And I would like to also ask the three of our chief investigators to join us for the panel. This is uh, Associate Professor Min Chen from the University of Sydney, uh, Dr. David Jordan from the University of Queensland, and Professor Graham Hammer, also from the University of Queensland. Please welcome Bob, Min, David and Graham. Thanks, Susanna. Um, I'd just oh, like to... Oh, and Professor Ian Chubb, uh, who we can address questions to also. Um, I'd like to thank everyone uh, for attending this um, forum and um, taking the opportunity to uh, hopefully ask some challenging questions to our, our panel here. Um, you can either address your questions directly um, to the folk here or you can, uh, I can uh, try and apportion the question to the correct uh, person who I judge uh, would be able to answer it. Um, but um, I think just to, to begin the, the session, uh, the two speakers we heard uh, discussing the science that will go on uh, in this uh, Centre of Excellence are really, uh, in a nutshell, um, describe the global issues that we're trying to deal with. Um, uh, the burgeoning population and the pressure that that population is putting on the planet uh, is something that's not going to go away. Um, and uh, as plant biologists and crop physiologists, um, uh, we can't really do very much about um, reducing population growth and the impact that has on uh, resource utilisation, but we can do something um, about crop productivity and better utilisation of uh, the declining land area that we have available for agricultural production. So um, uh, in the context of uh, the global challenge that we have, well, I'm sure that there are some very uh, interesting questions that you'd like to put um, uh, to the scientists uh, before you. Uh, who'd like to, to kick off the uh, Q&A? So you guys talked a lot about um, light use efficiency maybe going to 40, but how does water factor in if we don't have any water to go Graham, you're, you're a, a great fan of uh, modeling water use in plants. Would you like to, to comment on the model? Uh, that's a good question. Um, the, one of the components in modeling this is, is to look at the nexus between uh, photosynthesis and transpiration. So, whether or not you can make a manipulation of the system here that uh, either maintains or enhances your water use efficiency at the same time. So, part of the modeling effort is about trying to bring those interactions play. So you can look at if you're increasing efficiency, now you're also increasing water. Um, so and, and in fact, John mentioned it, you know, the, the reflection back. What are the what are the components of the photosynthetic system that you may want to manipulate? Because that would be the issue that would dominate. As well as looking at here's what we are manipulating, what will that do? Um, what might need to be done so that we don't in a situation where water or nitrogen is the other factor that um, can impede progress. So I think that's part of the question. Yes. So you mentioned that there's Perhaps I can answer that. Um, so at the moment we're working in, in model plants, uh, except for um, there's so and so, so that work that John talked about with the bicarbonate transport and being put in that's been put into tobacco plants, uh, largely because tobacco plants uh, you can do chlorophyll translation. But the, the the next step of that will be to actually take that into rice in the near to not too distant future. But we're at the, at the proof of concept stage, as John was alluding to, that we have proteins in membranes, but we're still at the problem stage of 
study the marine macrophages in the way that they can show that they function properly. Uh, the same thing with the rubisco, uh, that's actually been known in tobacco as well, because that's again a model plane in which we can manipulate the chloroplast genome. But the intention there is to, to transfer it into, into to wheat and rice and give some of the adoptives in the future, although that's somewhat more limited by the availability of chloroplast transformation. <laughs> One of the other things driving photosynthesis in the real world is sink strength. Do you think you can uh, proceed without worrying about sink strength? Thanks, Jane. Um, that's basically why I put up uh, the first two examples of wood increasing photosynthesis, increase yield. Uh, it's, it's a perennial uh, chicken and egg question. And I think you basically do need to address both ends. So not only do we have to increase the source, but we do have to pay attention to increasing the sink strength. Um, now, the International, International Wheat Yield Partnership at CIMIT, uh, that was one of the, the three programs. Uh, one was to increase photosynthesis, uh, another was to look at the source sink, uh, the, the ear demand. So it's, it's true, uh, you can't just uh, increase the supply of, uh, of photosynthate to the plant, but the plant has to be able to deal with it at the other end. One interesting comment that I'd make on that is that it, and it maybe flies in the face of what we're trying to do, but it's quite possible the plants today are adapted to a much lower CO2 concentration than they're currently growing at, so that there, there, that there is a potential that basically that we're already out of with regard to matching increased photosynthesis with sink strength. And so, so I think considerable breeding efforts need to go on to breeding plants even to perform as well as if they can at today's CO2 concentrations, let alone the increased CO2 concentrations. Perhaps I could <coughs> add to that. Um, in the example of rice, uh, it's a good one. Um, the International Rice Research Institute now, um, for the past 10 years, has been um, uh, realising that uh, there are more available sinks, if you like, in rice uh, that can be filled. Uh, there was a major jump in uh, rice breeding when the new super rice varieties were developed, where suddenly um, there was a 30% increase in the available flowers which could form grain. Uh, and in, those, in that particular crop, there's insufficient photosynthetic push to fill those um, grains. So there's at least 30% more sink strength available in rice, for example, that we can currently um, utilise. So um, in terms of translating that increased photosynthetic uh, push into a crop plant, rice, I think, will be a good one. Make a brief comment on that. I think it's a good question. But, uh, Tony, I, I think the, the big changes are often made when you move a plant or a crop into another level of exploitable genetic variation. So, if you can increase the supply side of things, you then start to look at things that you couldn't look at before you've done that. And, and that's where big changes can come from. Do you have any other questions? Thanks. So I've got a question from Min. Uh, very interested in changing the, the uh, chlorophyll distribution within, within plants. What, what sort of extra resourcing would the plant need to, to do to change its uh, chlorophyll distribution in such a way that it would have a significant impact on photosynthesis? It need more allocation of resources to to actually achieve that, or can it be done without uh, a large expenditure in uh, available assimilates? Um, I think that is the um, because uh, after the red shift of crop field, naturally we isolate from this ocean, from ocean cyanobacteria. So, right now, if we want to apply them in the crops, so we have to understand the biochemistry processing. So, that is what we are doing, and then so. For the crop field biosynthesis, actually, whatever the modification that happened really late stage. So that means we should be able to modify them once we found that there was the gene response for these new crop fields. And then we should be able to apply into the crop and then so that it would be, have the potential extension of this spectral absorbent. That is what we talk about, the 90% of the solar energy. Please. Going on from that, though, but doesn't, I mean, I'm not a photosynthesis expert, but doesn't the, you, wouldn't you need the rest of the protein complex to 
capture the energy and pass it on. I mean, you can't just hope that that chlorophyll is going to get into a normal photosystem to centre, can you? Yeah, that's a really good question because we really also investigate whether once replace this chlorophyll, whether the photosynthesis photosynthetic system can cope with them. This is also it's and the very primary result we found actually plants that can modify the chlorophyll. That means they can use whatever chlorophyll you apply for them. So they can adapt their system to do that. So that is the for the protein base, I think that do have able to welcome to the new chlorophyll. That is not a very good problem. I have a question for Professor Chow. Um, you mentioned several times that um, we have a shortage of people going into science, if I understood correctly, and specifically into plant sciences. Um, can you give us more hard numbers of that? And if that trend is correct, then what do you think are the causes for that uh, shortage of plant scientists or plant science students? Um, well, uh, the um Simplify to answer the first part of your question was that the uh, Council of Agricultural uh, Council of Deans of Agricultural Science, they're not agricultural deans. Um, they, uh, well, they, um, and they say that demand outstrips supply by five to one presently. Um, the number has gone down to about 400 graduates a year from a much higher number a decade ago. Uh, round about that order on what was around, of course, um, as I number I, I think that's right. Um, and uh, but anyway, it's, it's gone down by a very substantial amounts <coughs> over a decade. Um, the uh, what are the reasons for it? Um, well, um, there are multiple ones. There are social reasons, like uh, you know, back in the day. Um, the sons and daughters of farmers would go to the smoke and study agricultural science and go back to the farm. They're doing that um, uh, much less these days. Um, I think, well, personally, I don't think our um, educational program inspires people into understanding the majesty of the sort of things that we're talking about, like some of this here. Um, and, uh, and so it becomes much more routine, therefore it becomes hard, therefore it becomes boring therefore it gets avoided. So we have um, the lowest number of students studying science and maths in senior secondary school in 20 years right now. Um, now the number enrolled in science degrees has gone up over the last three or four years by about 30 percent, so it's not insignificant. Um, and uh, the, um, uh, what, what we don't know yet is whether that was because of the hex discount that was given in 2008 or whatever it was and because uh, it only stopped last year. Um, so uh, there are a number of reasons, but, but I, I, I think uh, um, if, if you were to sort of say, what is an underlying issue in this? I think it's the way the Australian community has come to regard science. Um, we, did, we had a survey done by the Academy four, three or four years ago, and there are two figures in that that stick in my mind and will never leave it. One was when year 12 students were asked whether science would be uh, an important part of their future. One percent of those students studying some, not studying science said yes, that it would. One percent, and they out there um, and they're voting, and, um, and, and and they're judging whether an argument that says give us more because we haven't got enough is a good enough argument for them to continue to pay for it. Um, so one percent, that's stunning. Uh, what was even more stunning for me was the fact that when they asked students studying science in senior secondary, only 30% said yes, science would be important part of their future. So I, I think it goes back to a deeply cultural issue, um, and, uh, and I think to change that, we've got to change the way the community regards science. We've got to explain things like what you're here today celebrating an opening and why it's important for the future, not just of Australia, but of humanity, and the, the role that Australia plays in that. Um, how, how unbelievably awe-inspiring it can be to do some of this stuff, and basically to educate in a way that demonstrates to students how science is practiced, and not just how it's really about in the textbook. If I could just comment on that. I think we've got a marketing problem in plant-based agricultural um, 
uh, education and um, we had a student come uh, through the Phenomics Centre a while back and was just amazed uh, by the technology we were using and uh, the comment was, I thought agriculture was just digging in the dirt. Um, so, you know, if we've got initiatives like this and we can bring, uh, we can show the application of high technology um, and gene technology in uh, issues that are as important as feeding the world, I think uh, we'll have a better chance of attracting uh, students away from medical biotechnology and uh, in plant science. Any more questions? Shall we call things to a close? Well, I'd like you to join me in, in thanking our panel members and all of our speakers today, and thanks very much for coming.